happy today to have uh, a joint work between robotics and other based systems engineering to try to uh, make some linkages between the user models and especially robotics and taking a more holistic view of systems. And the speaker today is going to be Professor Sandra Quist from, let's see if I can pronounce it correctly, Technician University of Very good. Okay. So she, she holds the Visa Beckman Fair. And there, and she's the director of the Institute for Information and Radio Control. And she received a diploma in aerospace and space engineering in 2002 from the University of Berlin, or two. And then she received her doctorate degree in electrical engineering and information technology in 2008 from two. Right? She was in the okay. So she has been a postdoc fellow in electrical technology in Oxygen Robotics. And the circuit control, corporate control, nervous systems. She's the chair of the uh, IEEE Corporation Society student activities. And also, she chairs the awards of the for the best student paper award, for which some of you have competed. And she has been on the board of governors of IEEE Corporation Society since 2010. Her title today is Fair Control Under Resource Constraints. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you very much, John. Um, thank you for inviting me. For inviting me here, giving me uh, the honor to present some of our work here. Um, I will, in my talk today, um, so you introduced me as a roboticist, I will show you one side of our work that is more robotics, that's um, where we'll mainly show videos. And there is another part of the talk where I will mainly show some system uh, theoretic approach to care control and the resource constraint. So as I already announced, there will be no kind of holistic view on robotics and fair control, unfortunately. So we're not that far yet. So I'm trying to bring those two things together um, in my lab. And uh, as you will, as you see, so my, my general vision is to have uh, distributed or decision making um, on distributedly available information. Uh, among systems that could be robots, but also include the human. And uh, my, well, the research field that we are currently active on is in that area on the co-design, what we try, on the co-design of control and communication protocols. Uh, we also look into distributed decision making and control architectures. I will not talk about that today, but we look in particular on control and the privacy constraints. Um, and uh, in cooperation and both negotiation schemes, including the human. And uh, so I put here some of the, let's say, orthogonal um, research challenges uh, that we see in such fields. So on the one hand, you have the challenge of communication, computation, uncertainty and constraints, um, agent heterogeneity, uncertainty, autonomy, and also large scale of agents that somehow are for me the kind of orthogonal scales or orthogonal dimensions to um, have this complex system when we call it a of complex system. And I will first now in my talk show you some of my or, or works in let's say rather robotics that I start actually in my PhD with um, telerobotic systems where you have a robot on the one hand uh, and the remote side and the local robot, the public interface, and you would like to control this robot through a communication network um, internet and the uh, so you have a lot of sensors here, force sensors, um, stereo cameras, um, microphones, and you try to give a good feedback of the remote environment to the human. And ideally, you want that when the human operates that system and has this head-mounted display, that it directly feels present in this remote environment. So it's called transparency, where you make all the technical system in between transparent. And of course, you have a global control loop closed here over the communication uh, system. So you experience communication time delay and packet loss. And just for your, uh, so we did some experiments. And this is now a demonstration experiment, uh, more or less, uh, where we had, uh, that was in 2006 or seven, I believe, uh, where we had a uh, teleoperation set up between Scuba and Japan, uh, where the teleoperator was and in Munich where the local interface, the human operator was, and you see here a uh, human operator operating this haptic display, having a head-mounted display, the head is tracked, and uh, on the other hand, you see the 
um, you see HRP2, and uh, he also moves the head according to the, um, the human. And here is a closer view. So we track the head position, the head movement, and also we have this haptic interface here, the seven degree of freedom um, robot. And on the other hand, we have the HRP2. Uh, who has a stereo camera um, system here, so you get the stereo impression of the remote environment, and you operate in the end the end effector here. Um, the grip. Well, what was the delay? Yeah, that will come. So the delay that was in 2007 was 100, 278 milliseconds in round trip delay. Uh, we did some experiments. It was amazingly uh, the variance was only two milliseconds, so it was could be considered as quasi. Uh, constant delay, um, but one of the main problems and, uh, was, of course, the local control groups here, they operate at a frequent or at an update rate of 1,000 to 5,000 hertz, um, because it's force control, and uh, of course you cannot send over the internet uh, 5,000 packets per second, so you have to do something smart um, about how often you sample the information. And actually that was the first inspiration of what I will talk later about, about the event trigger control. Um, so we do some kind of event trigger mechanism um, to realize this control uh, over the event. Um, another, so I, I just scanned through some of our um, videos uh, on the robotic side, and later on there will be the more theoretical stuff. So another um, topic we are interested in is incorporated mobile manipulation. So we have these mobile um, omnidirectional platforms here. This is a lab view, so this is actually part of a big um, joint project between um, computer scientists, neurobiologists, control people, robotics people. So a lot of uh, people contributed to this one here. And the idea is to have robots, of course, in the future, being able to manipulate something like that in unstructured environments, so they have to perceive the environment. We have uh, external sensing, so for example cameras that could be wireless in the future. Um, we have local sensing here, so we have really a, a complex system and based on, uh, we have a collaboration, we have a joint goal, namely to move this object here uh, from an initial configuration to a final configuration, so you definitely have distributed sensing, where for example also from the, the, the top view, the top cameras, um, and uh, we have distributed control, so each of the manipulators is controlled, of course, individually. And one of the major problems is here that you have closed kinematic chains because you have a rigid object in between. And as soon as you start to accumulate uh, errors, for example, by odometry that you have automatically in mobile manipulation, you will see uh, large forces and that you, of course, like to avoid. So these closed kinematic chains under uncertainty are one of the, one of the research topics in that area. So there is communication through the there's, forces that pass through, right? Exactly. So there's what you say, it's implicit communication. Um, we have on one hand, uh, so through the forces. So each of the end effector has, uh, has a force sensor. So we implicitly see the um, mm. input. Well, we can measure kind of the input to the overall system, um, but cannot distinguish between individual manuals. So another um, interest, so again, our lab space so if here. If someone does not bleed, can you tell who is it? Hmm? If someone does not do their first step, can you tell who it is? Um, if there is, well, if you assume there's no external forces acting on the object, and it's only two manipulators, in 2D you can do it. Um, otherwise, no. Even so because you only see like the combination of all forces, if you have like three manipulators um, grasping the object, then you cannot distinguish between the one or the other because you only see the sum. If you combine with vision, can you? Um, if you combine with vision, then you probably still can't. You would somehow need uh, access to the internal torques <coughs> of the system. That, I, this is not a very uh, I cannot prove it right now, but that would be my best point for advancing. So, but uh, yeah. So in the 
Here in, the, in this task, so we're also looking at this cooperative manipulation together with humans, and there, uh, this is uh, very challenging, so you want the robot, of course, to contribute towards the task, so you don't want the human to do all, uh, all the, the moving of this table, for example, so important um, things is you have to predict the human behavior in order to actively contribute um, to the movement, and the uh, difficult thing is that usually human behavior it's um, very difficult to identify because you don't know the internal goals, you don't know the uh, internal signals to the muscles. So um, basically what we use is we do some kind of work with machine learning people um, who use uh, either Gaussian processes or um, hidden Markov models to model in repeated trials the motion of the um, of the human, and but still you have a lot of uncertainty because each or every human would act differently, and so you one of the challenges here is that you take into account the uncertain human behavior in your control design. So the idea is you would assist more aggressively if you are very certain about the human motion intention, less um, aggressive if you are not. And the nice let's say framework for for that is risk sensitive control where you can explicitly, or any kind of um, mean variance trade off control, where you can explicitly uh, adapt your control, control gains depending on the uncertainty that you expect. expect. So this is, uh, and we also work actually with psychologists, so one of um, my team members is even a psych has a psychology degree. Um, you can also add voice reports voice requests from the human, just like ah, two people. Exactly, so you could also, I mean, that would be the next stage. At the moment, we're really looking only into the, um, well, implicit communication, again, through forces on the one hand, but also uh, through the, the pose of the human, so really in a continuous domain. But if you add, for example, voice, then suddenly you get symbolic uh, kind of communication, and it would be very interesting um, to go farther than that, so it's very exciting to see those directions. Okay, so that was, I think, the... A quick question around yeah. that too. Have you ever looked at adding something like EEG or something on humans to actually try to discern some of these, uh, these internals? Uh, to be honest, I'm currently buying an EEG system. <laughs> well, I'm buying an EMG system. So, because EEG is uh, very difficult, I think that's what I hear from psychologists, I'm not an expert, um, it's very difficult to discern really the intention, motor intention, uh, motor control signals just from, from uh, the very blurry thing you have here. But what you can do is actually, um, that's what we want to try, is that you use signals from the human um, in terms of muscle activation. And I think uh, muscle activation, then we could also have kind of a, so there are variable devices that are wireless. So you can really use muscle um, activation and try to infer, for example, the uh, forces that are acting on the table based on the um, posture of the human and the activation. So having an inverse dynamical model from the human where you can, um, well, yeah. You have a lot of muscles. You've got a lot of muscles, but there are some people in the world, for example, um, um, and, uh, uh, Professor Nakamura at Todai and also uh, Osama Khatib, um, who have very sophisticated human models, that biomechanical models, where you can really, based on such activation, uh, they can at least approximately infer what, for example, the forces will be, how I push here. So, but it's, you're right, it's a it's probably a uh, under um, specified problem if you want to look at that. Yeah. But that's the challenge. So, okay, and this is uh, one more on the, um, let's say, on the robotic side. So this is kind of the final demonstration scenario that we had to present in front of many people in reviewers. Um, where this is really a collaboration effort between computer scientists and um, people from machine learning and people from uh, yeah from robotics control um, even psychology. So yeah, here this is just a recording of the 
um, of, of the, the, the scenario. So we have two robots, um, and it's just to demonstrate the individual contributions by the groups in one single big scenario. And the idea is you have these two robots, they're supposed to search in the space cooperatively for those for those tires. They use vision, as you will see in a minute, um, to search for the special markers here. So you see this is the picture that um, or that the, that the robot has to identify, or based on that, the robot has to identify um, this object. And the goal is to mount these uh, tires. So you see the other robot is uh, still is still searching um, for this tire. And uh, now the robot has to mount it. So here you see the top view uh, that is used also for the for motion of the motion detection of the robots, and uh, kind of, and here you see the, the view from the from the laser range finders that uses ROS essentially to, to map the environment and also of course uh, the obstacles and to localize uh, themselves. In addition, so we have a global localization system and a local one on the robots. <laughs> and, uh, um, this is just to see that this vision-based control algorithm is really reactive, um, so the robot would only grasp after a certain, um, or do this grasp primitives if a certain condition has been uh, achieved, and now there's some kind of, well, it's a pack, typical pack in the whole task uh, where the robot has to run. And again, here you have a lot of sensors. Um, it's a lot of uh, computation, so we actually have a computing center in the back where we send all our signals. Um, of course, it would be nice if we could do everything on the robot, but especially in planning. Um, there are highly, um, very complex planning approaches. Uh, in, if you do that in high dimensional spaces, uh, you can't do real time, um, you can't do that in real time. So that was the... Um, so the what to do is already stored. Hmm? The what to do is already stored. To what? what to do. The what to do. The what to do. Is already stored. This is here already stored, so they so know, they have kind of, it's kind of a primitive based approach that you wait for a transition um, to happen and based on uh, this transition, so the next functionality mm -hmm. would start. So as you, for example, have seen the, the grasping uh, would only start after the, the grasping primitive, after, for example, the condition was that the tire was not moving more than a certain So in some sense, they know the actions, the primitive actions, and the sequence of that. Um, so in, in that scenario, I think. So we had also scenarios where we had multi-robot um, cooperation, where they had to allocate the tasks among them, and that becomes really very quickly, um, it's a combinatorial search, then it becomes very quickly uh, Un unfeasible in real time if you have more than 10 actions and more than 4 robots. So it's um, okay, so that was, uh, let's say, the robotics part. Uh, I will not go into details about the individual approaches here, um, but I will today mainly talk about a more general topic about cyber physical systems that I would say robots are one of the important examples and also very future-oriented examples. And under cyber physical systems, um, we understand the physical, biological, and engineered systems whose operations are monitored, coordinated, and controlled, and integrated by computing and communication core. And this is a, um, so this, I, I did not, that, that's not my definition. I took that from the cyber physical systems workshop we had uh, in, uh, in London. And the enabling technologies that really push forward towards that, uh, on the one hand, of course, we have uh, the internet, um, everything is communicating in between. We have uh, a small, uh, so yeah, we could communicate everywhere. We have very small sensing devices and we have distributed computational resources. And to put all that together, so if we think about going towards embedded intelligence, where you really have uh, local computation and everything. Um, one ro small robot are just one thing, but uh, even, for example, if you think about those variable systems for, for humans, um, that you could do computation on the human body. Um, so we really think that this is uh, yeah, the increasing complexity in those control tasks. 
world is this embedded computational communication is one of the important features that uh, make cyber physical systems um, so challenging. And uh, apart from robotics, as one um, application example, um, for example, body area sensor networks, production systems, smart homes, um, infrastructure systems are just other domains uh, where those uh, cyber physical systems play an important role. And uh, what I was, will talk about today is in particular about resource constraints. So if you think that all the computational resources, um, they become miniaturized, um, and also the communication devices, they become, uh, let's say, miniaturized, uh, an important everything becomes mobile. What you have to think about is in particular about energy constraints. So for example, we have um, sensors, distributed sensors in, in our environment, that are battery driven, so you have to think about when do you want to really transmit a new information and spend energy for the um, for the transmission of information, but also for the computation. Um, so energy constraints, communication limitations may be. So meanwhile, communications limitations become maybe less prominent, even though I will talk about that today as well. Um, and limited computational power. Uh, mainly, I think most of those um, constraints are also, in the end, energy constraints that you have to think about. So it's not about available bandwidth and theory, but really <coughs> when do you want to send something and spend energy on sending or computing something. And uh, if you think about the resource challenge in, in a cyber physical control system, uh, we think of a shared resource. So in our case, it will be um, a communication network. Uh, and this shared resource, you have multiple control loops that are competing um, for this shared resource. So they are not individual, in our setting, they are not individually coupled, but they are coupled through this resource sharing or through this coupling constraints. And what you need, of course, if you have such a resource, is some kind of idea how you distribute or whom to allocate the resource to. So kind of a scheduler that assigns resources, which won't be centralized or decentralized. And of course, the desirable properties of such schedulers are on the one hand that we would like to guarantee stability in the first place. Um, we would like to maximize the control performance, um, giving the available resources. It should be decentralized if possible, so that you are uh, so that you have a scalable um, system design, even if you have millions of such systems in your uh, in your yeah, in the overall system, millions of subsystems should be flexible and it should have attractive design. And uh, there's now two, let's say, paradigm, paradigms how you could design um, schedulers. One is that you say it's time triggered. So in advance, for example, you um, define a trigger. So at, at uh, you, you define kind of a triggering rule, for example, for system 1, 2, and 3, um, they get assigned certain time slots. Yeah, yeah. We assume that the clocks are synchronized, and you say, okay, system 1 um, triggers at site time slot 1, um, system 2 sends its information at time slot 2. Uh, the good thing is, so it's, um, well, it's related to sample data control, there's a extensive theory about that, so we can easily guarantee stability. Some sets also have a tractable design. Um, even though this design of these schedulers, I would not say it's tractable, because it's again a combinatorial problem. And uh, well, it could be decentralized in a sense that each, if once you have assigned the time slot and you assume it's synchronized clock, then each uh, local subsystem knows when to send something. But then if it's it's certainly not flexible. Um, if you add a subsystem here, then you have to recompute the whole schedule, and that's a combinatorial problem. And the question is, is it really the best control performance we could get, uh, given this resource sharing, uh, or given this uh, constrained resource that we have? And alternatively, and this is what I will talk about today, we have a event triggered scheduler design, where you say, OK, um, each subsystem locally decides when to send information, when it believes it's important. So when it believes there is an event, and I should update my controller with the new sensor information I have. And for example, uh, so we have an additional uh, 
thing here, this is the event uh, trigger, and then the event trigger um, decides based on the sensor information whether to send something over the network or not. So it's certainly decentralized because you have the event trigger only depending on this local information here. Um, it's flexible, well we will see that later, in the sense that you, if you add something here, you just add another event trigger. Um, but the question is, well, if you have a shared resource, you have, uh, so if two systems try to send at the same time, then if, as you have only one resource, you have to decide which of the system can, can transmit. And so you have sometimes, if for example, two systems try to send, uh, you have here blocking, so maybe um, you will not be, none of the system will be able to transmit. On the other hand, if none of the system things, subsystem things is now important, you have an event, uh, you even may have idle um, times for this uh, system. And the question here is, of course, when you have such blocking, can you still somehow guarantee stability? How about the control performance? And is it amenable to a tractable design? And this is what I will talk about today. So I will first talk about um, the single loop system, where um, how to design a event trigger, and particular how to question is can we do a co-design of event trigger and control? And the second part will be about fair resource sharing and multi loop control systems. Isn't all the other trade-offs between the two schemes just the, the extent to which you're resource limited? The, the time trigger scheme yes. works well because <coughs> very, very heavy load. Whereas the event trigger scheme is really mess up when you start to get close to your source limit because you know. We will see that uh, later. Yeah. So um, I would not fully uh, sign that statement. But uh, I, I will uh, we will talk about that exactly here in this uh, in this part. There's lots of theories with this in all fields. Um, okay, but maybe we can discuss that after I've presented the results and then uh, we can see what, what are your intrinsic assumptions on the systems and what, what are the differences. So, looking at, I mean, there's uh, the event trigger sampling um, schemes, maybe, so there's a seminal work by Dan Hudson and uh, Astrom uh, from, I think, 2001. So they show that for a very simple integrator case, uh, that uh, if you compare a time triggered, um, so it was a scalar system, it was that deep control, um, and uh, if you have a time triggered system where you sample every time, uh, every time in double H, and they compared it with a event triggered system where they sample only if the state, and the goal was to bring the state to the origin, only if the state uh, is larger, the state. Um, Huh? Larger than the threshold. Exactly. So it was a threshold, and you see here, for example, they would sample here, and they would sample here, and then make it a reset control. And what they found is that for this simple system, that the event trigger um, control system has a smaller state variance for the same mean sampling interval, and it was only one third of the original um, time trigger version. So this indicates that even if you use the, uh, the um, the system or a communication system with you send the same amount of information, you get a significantly better control performance. So as a result, event triggered, at least for the simple case, outperforms time triggered. And of course there's uh, many works since then. Um, and okay, maybe I start with the co-design problem. Um, the, the, the core problem now is to find a controller and transmission strategy for an optimal trade-off between control performance, the more, the more often I sample, I would expect the better control performance becomes, um, and this energy communication constraint, uh, so that I don't want to sample too often because every sample somehow means that I have to invest um, energy, for example, from my um, smart wireless sensor. Mm -hmm. And so there's uh, really a lot of work since then to find, for example, the optimal transmission scheme, scheme um, given a fixed control, or find the optimal control given a fixed transmission strategy. And one of the questions we ask is, can we somehow find a joint optimal um, transmission scheme and control? And just to give you some works on, on for example, there's a lot of work on stochastic event-triggered systems, uh, also John did a lot of work, and uh, Lunio also did a lot of work, 
and also nonlinear systems, for example, are in here, um, also contributed in that area. Okay, now the co-design question we will investigate, and for that we look into an extended linear quadratic problem where we have the controller, the plant, we are seeing here for simplicity of uh, the notation that we directly can measure the states, and uh, yeah, we have this event trigger, and the event trigger decides on this delta k, the, we have a linear process here with whitewash noise, and we assume that we keep here ideal communication in the sense that if this delta k is 1, so it's a variable, a binary variable, if this is 1, then this, this is closed and we will send something over here uh, and we will definitely receive the update over here. And we will see a zero symbol if this is not. Now, we want to look, search for a controller uh, that has a policy given based on the past observations and we start with including all the observations available to the controller until this time and the event trigger should be a policy at k um, depending on the past observation, so it could be causal mapping, um, and which means, which decides on whether to send something, to send the uh, xk or uh, not to send. And the control problem now we pose is we want to find this policies f for the event trigger and gamma for the controller that minimizes this um, non-conventional um, LQ problem, so this is conventional of course, but here you see there's an extra term, um, this lambda uh, is the price I have to pay for every um, transmission I do. So if there is zero transmission, I pay nothing, if there is a transmission in time step k, I can't pay exactly the price of lambda. Because we have two decision makers here, and they have different sets of information available, this is a hard problem. So we have a distributed optimization uh, information pattern here, and it's difficult uh, to solve by standard techniques from dynamic programming. And it would be nice to get somehow uh, yeah, a simpler decomposed, um, decomposed problem. And just to compare it with classical LQ, where we have the measurement equations and the classical LQ functional, um, we know that there's a separation principle, and the separation principle says you can design the regulator, so the controller and the estimator separately. Um, the regulator is based as you, so you uh, design it as if it was a deterministic problem, and you design the estimator as a linear um, least square estimator, uh, so this is the control order. And jointly they will give you an um, optimal, so they will optimize this function. So this allows a very efficient design of the optimal control law and a linear system, so this will be common. And you just saw the Riquati equation for the other. Now, if we combine it to the optimal event trigger controller, now we don't only want to find this gamma, so the control policy, but also this uh, policy, this decision policy, whether to send something over the network or not. And the first thing we could show is that actually the certainty equivalence controller, so that kind of weak separation, um, the certainty equivalence controller is optimal. So, in fact, the same controller that was optimal for the classical LQ system um, is optimal for this uh, non-conventional um, LQ functional. So we again have this LK, it's coming out of the Riccati equation, and here we have a least square estimate. So we have a separation between the regulator on the one hand and the scheduling and estimation um, problem. So we could already decomp or take one of the problems out so we don't have, now only have to take care about the scheduling and estimation problem. And so in that area, so having the optimal controller um, for optimal observer and optimal event trigger, well, there's still a <coughs> debate, let's say, whether this is separable. Um, so Nuno found has some nice results, where actually for the Scala case, it says that uh, you can separate it, and the question is, does it also uh, hold for um, the general case of uh, uh, multidimensional systems? But let's say if it would hold, then the, um, in this, uh, then this optimal estimator would be um, 
well, you set off, you take off course the state x if you receive it. Um, meanwhile, you just make a prediction um, based on this least squares. And uh, yeah, if it if it does not hold, yeah. So what's the difference to the classical uh, thing? Of course, if you have delta k here equal to zero, then you still know something about your state. Yeah, you know that it must be within uh, a certain region. And this information, so we know that there would be a bias term here that modifies the um, uh, the, S, the the predictor here, um, and then the yeah, it takes into account this information. But so far we cannot really, uh, we have no result on that. That for the general case also the separation holds. What we can say is that the optimal event trigger is uh, we can compute by value iteration and it, in essence it's, we have to solve. So we have to find a policy f um, minimizing this um, expectation here and you see here is this uh, EK is actually the prediction error um, and it's the prediction error between the current state and the estimated <coughs> state at the controller and the uh, yeah for the implementation um, so we have here now the controller uh, that is uh, from the Riccati equation so you can compute straightforwardly we have a least square estimator <coughs> here which is our state estimator and here is the event trigger and the event trigger computes the difference <coughs> this is a copy actually um, computes the estimation error and the estimation error here um, goes into this uh, policy F, so fk is a um, measurable policy of this estimation error and decides about this delta k. If you force estimation, hmm? if you force separation, can you get a bound of the focus if we force separation, well, at the moment, uh, we're still not even sure whether, uh, so, so that would already answer whether there is separation possible at all or not. At the moment, we don't even know whether it is possible for a general case. But if you just do the, put the, uh, the estimate of the state, mm -hmm. and you use the controller, is there any way to get any other bound in the uh, Um. Because there is dual effect and all that stuff that is discussed, and that could get the bound. But the question is, do you know if the bound, if the bound exists, and how non tight or tight it is? Well, um, if I knew a bound for that, and it would be tight, yeah. um, <laughs> then, then it would be already nice. Yeah, so, um, so I, I can't answer your question. Okay. Um, in a qualified way. So I have to think about that longer. Whether it, maybe that's some way, another way to uh, prove maybe whether separation could exist or not. So, and, but what comes out of the uh, dynamic programming actually, so we saw it's a finite horizon um, cost function that we had. Uh, you see here it's the time k, and what you see here is actually the threshold or the policy that comes is fk that comes out based on the estimation error. And you see it's a threshold policy, as you look at here. Um, if your estimation error is within this gray shaded area, then you don't send something. As soon as it hits here, uh, you will send, you make a transition. So, and this, uh, okay, then we have some extension to non ideal communication. Of course, then it's even more difficult, uh, only if you have a acknowledgement channel that is without delay, uh, without any errors, and you can still uh, say something about it. Um, so it's only for special cases, you know, that there's certain decommitted control that's still um, Okay, for the extension to the infinite horizon, we look at the average cost, um, and we can show that actually Again, the certainty equivalence controller is optimal, and we can also uh, show that it's stochastically stable um, with the bound state coordinate. Okay, here's some numeric comparison for the single loop case before I come to the multi loop case. So, very simple system, AB equal to 1, a scalar system, and 
uh, you see here, just a, just a demonstration. So for this, this is the, the estimation error, and you see here a comparison between the time trigger and the uh, event trigger. So just to see, as soon as you have this uh, estimation error going over uh, this threshold, uh, then you will send something. So just to see that there's an asynchronous sampling then, of course. And uh, if we look at the, um, at the control cost, maybe that gives some answer. Um, so we compute the communication cost. It's kind of a rate. Yeah, it's a average rate that we compute here is R. And we see that, for, of course, for um, if we don't send everything, um, we have a, yeah, our um, control cost becomes unbounded. Um, if we send in every time and sense, that would mean that we um, get sample every time, um, then we have this lower bar. And you see that we compare a time trigger, so where we compute the optimal time trigger uh, in advance to make it a pair comparison, so it's not only um, every every instance, but it's only this, this uh, way, or here we come. Well, okay, for the comparison, we use the best time trigger we could get. So um, that's optimized, and to com compare this with event trigger, and you see that still the the control cost is significantly lower um, for this event trigger. Okay, now this was a single loop system. So um, now we come to the multi loop system. How much time do I have actually? <coughs> okay. um, so the question is. If we have now such a system that we would ultimately um, uh, control, um, how should we allocate the, the resource? So we have now um, reviewed the event trigger, and I hope that I can convince you that the event trigger um, framework even gives uh, gives or has some good properties in terms of flexible system design. And so again, we use the same. Um, linear process, and we have one more variable here now, a blocking variable that is part of this shared resource, and the blocking variable actually is tells you if it's zero, then another system also tries to access the, um, the shared resource at the same time instant, and we would only um, have a transmission Z here that is unequal to the erasure symbol um, if both there was a request for the, this, the, the event trigger decided to send something and the shared resource was free, so there's no block. Now, in order to make, because it's a complicated problem, um, we look now at the microscopic level. So again, we use the same controller, CI, that is a certainty of equivalence controller. Um, we have uh, the scheduler. Well, at the moment, it's just a measurable function of the zi, so it's the information available here. And again, the scheduler is just a measurable function of uh, what I see here and uh, what I have information here. And um, we use now individual cost function, so it's the average cost criterion for every system i. So every system has its own, um, yeah, uh, <coughs> own cost function. And we have an individual request rate that we define. So again, this is like an average, average rate uh, that is defined here. So on the macroscopic level, so at, on the from the resource level, from the shared resource level, uh, we have a resource constraint that we need to satisfy. So we um, we say that we have a capacity of C. So we allow C parallel transmission over our shared resource, or three parallel access. And of course, in every time step, so we have N subsystems, large N, in every time step we ask that, of course, the number of, um, yeah, of transmissions over this resource is smaller or um, equal to this capacity constraint. And we look at here at such a social cost functional where we say, okay, we would like, uh, our goal is to, um, so the social welfare cost uh, to minimize that. So every um, subsystem should be able, at the same way, to minimize its control. Its control. Um, 
and of course it should be minimized now over this um, over the search um, of the policy for the event trigger and the control policy. And this is a difficult. I mean, this is a very difficult problem um, because uh, we search here for the individual strategies. So um, we have uh, proposed some kind of relaxation. So we try to decouple the community the resource allocation part from the um, local, let's say, cost or from the local control part. And we replace, just in the design, we replace this um, individual what is constraint, which has to hold an instantaneous constraint, by an average constraint. So we request that the average rate is the sum of all the rates is below the, um, the cost. But this is only for the design, and we find we have now this relaxed problem. It still looks bad, but in fact it's not so bad because we have a lot of uh, or a lot of things already. Um, it's actually um, if these ji are convex and uh, strictly decreasing um, functions of our rate, then this looks very similar to a classical network maxim um, utility maximization problem, in this case minimization problem. And uh, this is, uh, you can use dual, um, a dual formulation for that, and so we have a B-level design approach. So we use this dual formulation for this cost function, where we have the Lagrange multiplier here um, for the level one, and you see these individual level ones only contain information about individual subsystems and we have of course the global resource allocation level two and we look now into the level one so we want to design now the local controller and uh, control policy and um, event triggering policy uh, and of course it's exactly the single loop case so this cost function here is exactly what we have already solved for the single loop case so we can directly use those results. We have a certainty equivalence controller, and now we have to find the scheduler. And what we um, can show is actually that this function ji, this cost ji, is indeed a strictly convex decreasing function of this rate ri. And uh, so this is the Pareto frontier. And you could um, understand yeah, if you yeah, this is still the price you have to pay at a certain point that gives you then directly the, um, the threshold function of your scheduler. And so we have a special policy here, and in a second level, so this is like a global level, where I want to ship, uh, assign, the, or assign the resources. Um, we have a, we want to solve, we have to solve this cost function, um, and as it's decreasing in convex, um, well, it's okay. So this is uh, level two. And before I come to that, of course, because we have now um, all this blocking, we also have to have some kind of stability condition. And this uh, stability condition is given here. Um, so we can show that uh, the system will be stable, robustly stable, and I will explain what I mean by robust. Um, if this condition is satisfied. And you see here, this is the capacity of my shared resource. This is the number of subsystems. And this here is the maximum um, singular value of this A matrix. So, and what you see here is that in, in this condition, it's a sufficient condition, um, you only have a single I's. So there is not every I with N in a single condition. So you can test it really locally. Every subsystem knows, if it knows the, the C and the large N, um, it can de decide whether uh, it will be uh, of its sufficient capacity for stabilizing the loop. And it's robust in a sense that it's independent of all the others. So even if all the others um, ask for a lot of resources, um, we have an arbitration mechanism, if uh, I was not talking about, um, that would assign randomly, if there's more than uh, the number of C uh, requests, it would assign randomly. And so uh, this makes uh, yeah, this robust stability condition. So you don't know if it's correct. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 
I don't know if this is going to work when you have the blocking, right? This even working with blocking because we. Uh, you have it. You replace mm -hmm. the blocking. You replace the actual blocking with other. The, the stability condition is now individual. It's, it's apart from from the previous consideration. So for this, uh, we we yes, really look into blocking. But if we have more requests, then we have capacity. Then we will randomly assign the resource. So even if one of the subsystems is maliciously asking a lot, asking requesting a lot, because we have a random assignment, if there is more. Uh, more, more, system, or more systems requesting, um, you still have the chance to transmit. So the stability means what? It means that the um, that the estimation error. So the second order. Hmm? It's the second order moment. So, so it's ironic so and second order moment. So we have a bounded second order moment, and we converge to a stationary stability, uh, distribution. Um, and what we can say is that when we have this bi-level approach, that if, yeah, ah, sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, the old age one's memory goes, and I forgot what AI is. AI is the system matrix. Okay, so the AI matrix. So it's of the, of the AI system, system matrix. So if, for example, if it's unstable, yeah, yeah. or let's say uh, we have two here, um, larger than one something, and this says that the larger, the, the more on the right hand side the pole is, uh, more on the right hand side, the more no, outside of the of the of the uh, units of unit circle, um, the more capacity you need uh, to still be able to stabilize. So that's the intuition behind it. I'm not sure I understand the Oh, oh, I see. The bigger that is, the smaller it is. The bigger that right, is, the smaller yes, it right, is. Okay. So if it's stable, yeah, um, one should have, and of course, it's no, no problem at all. Um, it's stable, you don't have Exactly. Uh, yeah, but if, if you unstable, this curve becomes smaller yeah. than, than one. Okay, and it becomes a smaller. Okay. So this is in line with previous uh, results. Um, it's a sufficient stability condition. Right, it's in line that if I have a if it's in line in the sense that it has the same argument. Yeah. But yeah. and what we can show actually, we now assume this average thing, yeah, the average rate constraint. Um, what we can show actually that, that if the number of subsystems goes to infinity, then we achieve asymptotic optimality. So even though we have uh, not considered the instantaneous constraint um, in the in the and I will show you how it works. Uh, we can show actually optimal. Okay, tractable design because we are. Um, and maybe one more thing. So the the question now is if I um, have this uh, this resource constraint here, and I want to minimize, I want to allocate the resource. What I would like to do is do it in a decentralized way. And of course, again, we can use the dual formulation um, of, of this cost, of this, of this problem. And the, what we can do actually offline is we compute this gradient. And the gradient is actually uh, this, this term here. And use the gradient um, descent method, or ascent, ascent method. Um, here to, to compute the um, next, the price and the next time step. But still for the relaxed problem. Hmm? This is still for the relaxed problem, exactly. Um, and we can show actually that if we choose the step size small enough, okay. then it will go to the um, end. And now, of course, uh, it would be nice. I mean, you can, beforehand, you have this operation, you have a network manager, and that would implement this gradient descent. So you look at the, the current rates, or you look at the average rates, let's say, and could design a price, theta, uh, lambda, and give it to the systems, and then the systems would know which threshold policy to implement, and then everything would run. So this is kind of an offline step. What we would like to do now is to do this online. 
So in order to um, have, for example, uh, systems being able to join this shared resource, but also to go away, we would like to adjust the price um, depending on the current request. And we use an adaptive sample-based algorithms for that. So we kind of estimate this price for the resource at the moment. And we estimate based on the expected total rate, um, which is measured over a window. So we look into the past, um, look what are the, uh, the rates that the individual subsystems requested. Uh, we can compute this overall rate and compute using this gradient descent, uh, we, or I guess we can use, uh, we can compute um, the good, a good, uh, well, the next good price, and this is how it's implemented for one single system. So we get, have again the single loop, and now in each time step, or now, no, it's not in each time step, so we don't do that in each time step, but we wait for a certain window, um, measure the average transmission rate over the past window, um, send this to the resource manager, and it would be designed a new price. And if you could, if each of the subsystems here could, for example, see the request rates from all the other systems, then you could even implement this here, not in a centralized fashion, but each subsystem could itself um, compute its, the, the price of the resource, and the resource price then would um, uh, would define the thresholds through all the single loop uh, steps that I showed. Okay, here's the bonus comparison. I thought I have to stop. Yeah. Um, so here's the time triggered case. Um, here's the event triggered case. For a increasing number of subsystems, you see that uh, the event triggered case, first of all, is significantly lower. This is the social cost. Um, and that's really decreasing, and what's amazing here is that even though um, in a time triggered case you use actually all available time slots, yeah, but here you really have blockings. I mean, we implement that, of course, with blockings. Uh, you see that it's still, um, even though this throughput is less than one, and this is maybe a, an answer to your question. Uh, no, not yet. Okay, maybe we're coming there. Um, you're, you're allowing the capacity to increase within because you're keeping the very close. Of course. I mean, here what we do is uh, in the in these simulations, um, when we say that the number of subsystem increases, uh, we have a constant. We have a capacity increase. So in that sense, uh, okay. So this may be the the difference. That's okay. Well. You remember in wireless communication, there is no separate capacity. Excuse me? In wireless communication, there is no separate capacity. Yeah, well, I know that it both can and low hop. What separates the capacity from the wireless and the low hop? Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's Aloha is a different story. So if you use, for example, event triggered with Aloha, slot, even slotted Aloha, then you can show that actually event triggered performs worse than time triggered. Right. So, what I didn't say here is that, of course, the realization in the end of the communication protocol also has to say something. At the moment, we have, hmm? everything. everything has to say something. So you have to look at it in an integrated <laughs> way. At the moment, we are really assuming an arbitration mechanism. Uh, yeah. that is very so, the, the CAN example is also actually relevant here because uh, no CAN yeah. exactly addresses your problem on multiple people One is It's one specific example that is enormously important and has been widely studied. The second statement I did it, whether it's enormously important, I don't know what that is. Well, but then you did I'm sorry. Go ahead. Let's finish this. Okay, okay. Right later. So here is just a demonstration if you have n equals 2, um, we only have the relaxed constraint active, so this is not the real thing, but the, just to show you that um, the, actually the, it converges, so the threshold that everything converges um, over time k, and here you see that also the communication penalty, so this uh, gradient ascent mechanism um, works in a sense in the sense that it converges, and we also have a proof of convergence. Um, a proof of convergence, of course, 
for the instantaneous um, constraint being active. And uh, here you see that actually the threshold is <coughs> higher, and maybe you haven't seen, but one of the systems is unstable, one is stable, so the, sta the unstable one has lower uh, has a lower threshold, so has to uh, send more often. And you see here is the throughput. Uh, here is the estimated total rate, which fluctuates. And if you go um, for a larger system, but of course you scale the capacity in the same way, uh, then you reach the throughput reaches really the actual capacity constraint. So for large, in particular for large system, um, this is interesting. It also has no. Um, we can now attach the system, and this is how it works. So you see here, um, at until this time instance, we only have two systems. Um, from this time step on, um, we have four systems, and in that case, we keep the capacity the same. So, and you see here is a really increase in the thresholds, um, and this is the case uh, that you mentioned where we keep the capacity the same, but we add more systems to it. And um, now you can, come, of course, compare time triggers. Uh, has nice. Uh, you can guarantee stability very easily. Here we only have a sufficient condition, um, while the time trigger uh, you can easily have necessary and sufficient condition. Um, well, we have this B-level approach, which allows for tractable design, good control performance compared to the time trigger case. And we have this pricing mechanism that allows this distributed design flexibility. Okay, I hope I could somehow convince you that uh, event triggering is an interesting thing to um, address resource sharing, and in particular, if you have larger systems that we are composed of many subsystems, uh, it allows has a nice mechanism where you have this rule formulation um, that you can that you can read in a decentralized way. Uh, in Okay, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and your questions. Okay, and then we have to think about the kind of examples. We have time for some questions. And then there will be a round table here for your welcome to for the five, for four as long as you want. Uh, but any questions for now? Have you looked at how performance depends on the threshold that you use? Um, what you can say the higher the threshold, worse performance, sure, and you can the, the you, you can say it's not here. I don't you have looked into yeah. it, so you can explicitly uh, say that because uh, the, the the price you pay yeah. um, this uh, no, no. that directly sure, determines the threshold. Yeah. One of the things that's going on in those examples is that uh, having the threshold is actually a control advantage in many situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because it reduces the amount of, you know, uh, the jitter in the yeah. controller. So, um, so it's a good control design to get away from the LQ by putting in a threshold. And that's going to... So, that, so, so you, you mean threshold in the... In, 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 the, hmm? in the event trigger. Right. Well, but it was also a Q design for event you can put the What I'm saying is that you can put the response in any control and this oh, is Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. of course, yeah, yeah. I mean, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, so we're also going to, going to do the LQ realistic. Is that? Yeah, it, it actually reduces the action. It, it does all sorts of good things for the controller to actually have a small threshold um, on below which you don't have. <coughs> oh yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, in our case, then the separation property becomes, uh, well, I, I'm not sure whether that still holds, um, because then you have to assume yeah. something when, when you don't, well, you don't control in the team. I know that for if you have constant weight on board, what you, we do is still, we have constant control, so it's not like uh, we only control, but you're right, so control only when necessary is another interesting uh, paradigm. Nothing. Yeah. No broken, no fixing. Any other questions? I have lots of questions, but I'll ask you too. You might go to the original. Uh, well, I have only two. Excuse me, sir. I have to stay here, but I can ask more questions. So if I go to the original of the QIJ, I don't want to relax. You don't want to relax. Why can I not do the RD there? I mean, I know it's messy, but you can't do that. 